we're almost there. Awesome, we have some folks from Calgary. We have uh, uh, Matisse from, from France, welcome. It's always great to see the international community chiming in to these events. Amit from Bangladesh, welcome. Excellent, we have a great turnout this time around. So I believe that should be everyone. So I'm happy to uh, get this uh, ball rolling. So uh, welcome, welcome to everyone who, who, who is uh, uh, coming in. Feel free to um, uh, chime into the chat, tell us where you're coming from. Uh, and, uh, and we hope to uh, uh, complete this uh, AI meetup. Uh, uh, it'll be roughly an hour and a half. So we can expect this meetup to be uh, uh, concluded at around 6.30. Uh, PM and that's uh, mountain time, uh, local time here. So uh, about an hour and a half in total for all of you folks who are tuning in internationally from different time zones. Uh, my name is Vanimir Rak. I am the uh, marketing and communications associate here at Amy and I am tuning in from Edmonton, Alberta. Um, so for those of you who are joining us uh, uh, again, welcome back. And, and for those of you who are, are joining us for the first time, as we can see in the chat, welcome. Uh, welcome for the first time. We're so happy to have you join us. Um, Amy is the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. Um, Amy is one of uh, three centers of excellence as part of the Pan-Canadian AI strategy. And uh, it has a history uh, reaching back to decades of world leading AI research and training that has been uh, 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 putting us in a position as one of the global leaders of AI and ML. So whether you are looking to get involved as a business or you are a student looking for mentorship and or uh, uh, expertise, uh, or if you're just looking to get involved in the AI community, Amy has a whole host of programs uh, to help you, uh, to support you, and uh, we'd love to connect. So uh, do reach out to us uh, through amy.ca, our website, or email us through hello at amy.ca uh, to connect with us and to learn more. Uh, but uh, before we get started with uh, the presentations uh, this evening, I just want to uh, just go through a few housekeeping notes uh, so we're all um, aligned with what to expect this evening. Uh, the meetup is being recorded. So uh, we will have this meetup on our YouTube page as soon as possible so everyone can view and uh, view it and revisit it at their leisure. Uh, however, you can expect, as mentioned, uh, this uh, meetup to be about one and a half hours max. So uh, we are excited uh, to see all of your faces and we encourage you to uh, keep your camera on uh, during the meetup, just so our presenters can have some faces to engage with. It's always difficult to uh, uh, do a presentation like this in the virtual environment. So we'll, we'll try to keep uh, uh, this as, a, as, as much of a community uh, uh, event as possible uh, with, with what we have. So, um, and finally, as we continue to uh, improve these events with each iteration, you, you can expect a very short survey uh, to arrive in your inbox um, around uh, uh, how, how you thought this meetup went. If you think uh, we can do something better or, uh, uh, or you, you would like to see something from this meetup going forward, uh, do give us your feedback. Uh, it helps us out a lot, but uh, housekeeping aside, we have two great presentations for you this evening. Uh, there will be a quick Q&A time uh, at the end of each presentation. So if you have any questions for our presenters, uh, you will have uh, two ways to ask your questions. Uh, you can unmute yourself uh, during the question and answer period. Uh, and ask your question uh, verbally and or if you prefer, you can ask your uh, type in your question into the chat and I'm happy to read those out on your behalf. Um, so if it's okay with everyone, uh, I'm happy to jump right into the content. Uh, so I, I'd like to first uh, welcome our, our first presenter, Sarah Davis, who is co-president at the Artificial Intelligence in Medicine Student Society. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Zvon, and thank you everybody for joining. I'm just going to share my screen here. Sorry, this might take a second. Okay, does everything look good? I'm going to try to arrange things on my other screen here. Okay, perfect. All right. Yes, thanks again, everyone, for joining. And thank you to Zvon for inviting me and basically just giving me an opportunity to advertise for my student group and brag about it a little bit. This is something that uh, really um, 
kind of makes me excited to start my day and, and, and work with the people I work with. And so I could talk about it forever. So I'll, I'll try to keep this talk to half an hour though, just for the sake of time. Okay, uh, a few things that I'm going to talk about today. First, I'm going to give a quick introduction into the organization and some of the history behind it. I'll talk about some of the general events that we put on throughout the school year. Then I'm gonna get into some kind of more far reaching endeavors that we are undertaking right now. So uh, I'll talk about the community project we're working on this summer. I'm going to talk about the AI and medicine curriculum. Uh, and then uh, of course, our AI and healthcare symposia, which is what we are, I think most known for. And then I'll talk a little bit about the future of AIMS uh, just as a last attempt to kind of get people excited and hopefully get people involved if this is something that you are interested in. Okay, quickly about me. My name is Sarah Davis. Um, I see some familiar faces in the uh, in the chat and in the uh, participants. So if you see me around, hello again. Um, I am currently one of the two co-presidents of AIMS uh, starting this year and then as well as last year. Um, during the first year of the club, I was the VP internal. Right now, I'm a computing science master's student at the U of A studying under Dr. Russ Greiner, but my background is actually in biological sciences where I started my whole AI and healthcare journey. I am taking a little bit of time off of my master's degree right now to be a machine learning intern with Amy, so that has been really exciting to kind of officially be part of the Amy staff family. Uh, I have two email addresses here that I can be reached at. Uh, I will have a calling card at the end of this presentation to screenshot if you are interested in um, reaching out, chatting more, or, or learning anything else about what I'm talking about here today. Um, but I have these up just in case there's any uh, pressing questions or, or anything, or you want to note it down now, you have to leave before the end. Okay, so a lot of presentations I've seen about AI medicine try to define AI medicine, um, but for this talk, I think that's not as important as giving some examples about what AI medicine can do. So some examples I have here are predicting disease spread in advance. It can do disease recognition from images. It can re recommend treatments based on a patient's characteristics or their history, medical, demographic, otherwise. This is also known as precision medicine. It can even go bigger and streamline the hospital process. This is when we get into the kind of operations management side of things. And it can do a lot more, but I think the most important part that I wanna focus on is that this is all done so doctors can treat the patients rather than treat the diseases. So uh, doctors have something that AIs do not, which is uh, you know human-human interaction, capacity, uh, bedside manner. And so um, a lot of these tools can uh, alleviate a lot of the stress placed on doctors right now. Doctor burnout is a really, really big problem as it stands. And so some of these tools can uh, help to take some of the burden off of their, uh, them in their jobs and hopefully make their lives a little easier and uh, cure and treat patients even better in the process. So AIMS is a student-led organization, and what we're trying to do is inform and educate students on both the applications and the adoption of AI and ML uh, in healthcare and in medicine. The applications are far-reaching. There's a lot of uh, research on these things, but the adoption is a bit of a, a stickier situation. Medicine is a very, very old field, and historically it has not been very trusting of new technologies and new ways of doing things, and so probably somebody's life's work could be spent on, uh, you know, refining AI techniques uh, to convince doctors and, and healthcare providers that they're safe and important and, and can really help the process. Our second goal is to drive uh, kind of an interdisciplinary effort, and we want to create a collaborative community where people from all sorts of disciplines can uh, come together, meet each other, talk about their ideas and their experiences, and, and really hopefully learn a lot about um, me medicine, computing science, uh, or both, if, if they're just somebody with a passing interest in this. Um, we can't really talk about AI uh, in medicine without tons of other fields that have contributed to the history of these domains. So we really try to welcome as many people as possible uh, into the community and into our meetings. We think it really enriches the experience. 
So the history of Ames U Alberta in 2019, this uh, student club was founded by Amir Isu and Shane Eaton. Um, there was an existing Ames brand that uh, was created at the U of T, but nothing was really being done with it at this point. Uh, so these two kind of took that and, and built upon this and, and I think really kind of started Ames on the path to make it what it is today. So in our first year, we gained 150 members, which was uh, very mind blowing at the time. We of course heard chatter and we, we knew of people who were interested in the intersection of these fields, but we didn't expect to see such a strong uh, response to what we were doing. So we obviously kind of knew we were on the right track at that point. Now we have over 250 members, and this includes people who are officially members through our Bears Den, uh, people on the mailing list, and newsletter, and everything like that. Then in 2020, we hit another kind of cool milestone where uh, Ames started to gain some notoriety uh, outside of Edmonton and Alberta. So Ames chapters were started at four more Canadian universities over 2020. Um, which is great. Uh, so now we have some sister organizations that are kind of getting their footing and, and starting to put on events. And, and so, yeah, we're, we're kind of a, a happy Ames family and we're, we're growing fairly quickly. Okay, I would love to just quickly shout out the uh, Dream Team executives from this last year. Um, there are only eight of us, but we definitely did the work of many more people than that. Um, everyone did such a great job and, and we were able to uh, continue to uh, grow and thrive even in such a weird uh, pandemic year, right? So um, that's something I'm very proud of with uh, all of our team because I know a lot of student groups uh, kind of went into hibernation during this time. And because it uh, is the end of the school year and we're in the spring term now, we have determined our 2021-2022 executive board. I know some of the uh, new and old execs are uh, in this call right now watching this. So uh, hello to you guys. Um, I'm so excited to start work with these people and uh, just really see what, uh, what we are gonna be ending up doing in the new academic year. Okay, I would like to take everybody through just some general events just to get an idea of what we are normally doing during the school year as a student group. These have historically been fairly local, um, especially when things were in person, but of course we, we are, now that we're doing a lot of things online, uh, we're starting to open up to people from all over the place. Uh, we have kind of five general uh, kind of categories of, of uh, interactions we have with our community on the local level. We host general meetings. Uh, so this can include lectures, workshops, and open discussions, or at least that's what it included over the past year. Um, you can see examples of kind of all of these uh, events. I just kind of picked and chose some that were representative. Um, we've been known to participate in some community outreach events where uh, we will show up to other student groups events and, and you know, say hello talk to people and kind of spread the good word about AI medicine. Um, we also piloted a journal club over uh, the last year where people would talk about their research or interesting papers related to AI and medicine or healthcare. Um, especially over the last year, we have ramped up our social events. And uh, additionally, we have a biweekly newsletter that goes out uh, talking about what AIMS is up to, what other student groups are up to, new discoveries in the field, et cetera, just to try to keep people as in the loop as possible. So I'm actually gonna talk a little bit about something a little bit more concretely AI. Uh, this is our, uh, probably the community outreach example that AIMS has undertaken that I'm most proud of. This was Science Fun Day 2020, which was in very early 2020, I think uh, January or February. Um, this is an event that's organized for children ages 4 to 12 to learn about science. Um, of course, yeah, they come with their families. Uh, their families, of course, want them to learn more about science. So what Ames did is we created a tool that would classify drawings of organs that we had printed out on cardstock from webcam input. And so uh, here you can see a picture of the demo of the tool. And I'll go a bit more into detail about the tool. But something I learned is that many children have favorite organs. So 
uh, that was, I thought that was quite funny. They would, they would rustle through the pile and they would pick and be like, this is my favorite one. And so that's, that's great that kids at young ages have favorite organs. So the first step of this was creating a handmade and hand labeled data set. Um, there are 16 labels or organs in this case uh, and 500 total images. You can see I got some of my friends to help me out uh, in this because it was definitely an undertaking. Um, I'm not looking too pleased, I guess, in, in this one. That was probably like the hundredth image I had taken in that same position. Um, but yeah, overall, this was a fantastic learning experience for me. And I, I had a blast doing it, or at least I remember having a blast doing it. So once we had this data set, um, I used it to retrain a TensorFlow object detection model. Um, here is kind of a demonstration I have. I guess this is from like a year and a half ago at this point. So something interesting I noticed is that the classification would work very, very well if the organ was either upright or completely upside down. Um, as you can see, as I start to rotate this, it starts to think that it is, uh, or it starts to think the ear is an eye. And I realized it was overfitting to the dimensions of the cardstock that it was cut out on. And the uh, dimensions of the eye picture looked very, very similar to that of the ear that's rotated 90 degrees. Um, but overall, the tool worked quite well. And uh, the day of the debut was a success. And we talked to uh, around probably 200-ish people. Um, and uh, the kids, of course, were uh, some of them were, were very, very interested in this. Um, and they wanted to learn, but some of the most interesting conversations I think I had throughout this event was with some of the parents. Um, a lot of them had a lot to say about AI and a lot of, uh, um, I guess, fears about how AI was going to impact their lives. And so uh, it was a very interesting and fun experience talking to kids and explaining AI to kids on, on a level that, you know, a second grader could understand. Um, but also kind of uh, ramping up the uh, detail a little bit when talking to the parents and, and I guess, uh, trying to dispel some of their fears about what AI is and is not. So I thought this was just a fantastic experience. Okay, so back to kind of our day-to-day -day activities. Uh, the pandemic was not a great time to be a student group. I think uh, people who have been on the exec team of a student group in the last year would agree with me. So we had to shift our focus to more social events. Um, students are often taking multiple classes per day. And of course, they were all online. And so trying to get them to log in to like another lecture, but like in the evening this time was like not going to happen. So um, some examples of the ways that we tried to engage with our community a little bit uh, more actively was, uh, first of all, hosting weekly socials on our Discord server. We also always hosted the last half of our weekly exec meeting on the Discord server in case people wanted to join and kind of get more involved. We uh, dipped our toe into some community game nights where people would join and we would play some fun online games. And one of my favorites was that we did an AI and healthcare movie screening, and we are planning more of those in the future. Um, the movie we watched was Big Hero 6, which has probably the most adorable example of uh, an AI and healthcare robot there is, which is Baymax right here. So if you haven't seen the movie and you're looking for a cute movie that uh, delves surprisingly deep into AI and healthcare, uh, that is the movie that I recommend. All right, so now this is kind of the second section. This is our community project that we are undertaking this summer. This is completely new. This is not something Ames has ever done before. What we did was we put together a group of about 20 people and uh, they sorted themselves into two teams. Team one focuses on improving their programming skills. So these are people that are more uh, new to the computing science programming technical world. And team two focuses on improving their machine learning skills. So these are people with uh, a bit more of a, a technical background. So each team is responsible for one part of the project and kind of towards the end, we are planning to mesh these two pieces together to make a final deliverable. And we have an absolutely stellar group of people. Uh, there's people who are med students, people from computing science, life sciences, engineering, arts, and nursing. And these are all people who are uh, just interested in uh, learning to apply AI to a medical problem. So 
Here is a slide taken directly from our intro presentation for this uh, uh, project. So the problem we are trying to address is that one in 10,000 cases of surgery, uh, unfortunately, there is incomplete retention of surgical tools, uh, which means that a surgical tool that was there at the beginning is not there at the end. And that more often than not means that it was left inside of the patient. So there are very strict practices that the surgeons and the assistants must undertake of counting and recounting and recounting all of the tools each time. So what we want to do is create an image classification program that can uh, track, classify, and count the tools um, such that uh, perhaps you know each of the uh, people in the surgery room would only have to count once, just take a little bit of that burden off of them. And so this is going to be put together by our team that I had just mentioned earlier. This is what we want it to look like in the very end. We've agreed upon this. So um, we are going to start off, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse or not, but uh, we're going to start off with a simple GUI, graphical user interface. We're going to either upload or take a photo that includes some kind of medical tool. The photo will then be passed to kind of our machine learning back end of the, of the um, software where it will uh, kind of scan through the photo and it will find the tools, it will uh, classify them and count them, um, and it will draw a bounding box with its confidence level uh, around the tools, kind of similar to the um, organ classification uh, uh, tool that I talked about before. And then afterwards, it would pass it back to the interface and display it. Um, the reason that we wanted to go for something that uh, is image detection is because I had many people talk to me about the organ detection tool and say, well, you can't really apply that to medicine, right? That's just like an educational tool. Like, why, why does that even count? So we kind of took that idea and ran with it. How could we apply um, object detection in a medical scenario. So stay tuned. Um, I think as we make more progress, we'll be showing off what we have in our newsletters. So uh, hopefully if, if you're interested in seeing the outcome of this, uh, yeah, stay in touch. Okay, so next I'm gonna quickly talk about the AI and medicine curriculum. The motivation behind this is that artificial intelligence is uh, absent or very nearly absent from basically all medical education in Canada at the very least. And this leads to medical students being very wary of AI and ML. And I have here, why wouldn't they be? I mean, there's a lot of misinformation about AI and what AI can do. I, I guess a certain level of wariness is, is uh, healthy, but uh, I, I think what we are really trying to do is, is to help separate fact from fiction. So what we wanted to do was put together a course that will teach our community AI through a medical lens, hopefully include all of the important stuff and not include stuff that is not going to be that important for, for uh, them as they go forward. And uh, thinking a little bit bigger, we wanted to create a proof of concept for what kind of content could be included in Canadian medical school, uh, I guess, like AI courses for, uh, for students. So. Here is what the whole thing ended up looking like. We decided on two streams. So stream A is an introduction into AI for people with a background in medicine. Stream B is an introduction to medicine and medical data for people who have a more technical background. And then we also put together a series of seven workshops. All of these are about an hour to an hour and a half. Um, so people could get some hands-on experience uh, actually coding and, and creating AI. So all of these were delivered live at some point, um, but they are also all available on our website for free. Uh, you know, if, if there are any um, if there are any titles here that look interesting, they are uh, uh, findable from our website. And we had uh, about seventy, maybe a little bit higher than that, a number of students that engaged with this content uh, over this last term. So this was hosted during the winter term that just finished. Um, and our plans, I guess, in the future are just to continue revising it and, uh, yeah, hopefully uh, give a better and better experience each time. Also, if you complete all of the uh, lectures in the streams and uh, take all of the quizzes afterwards, we uh, made a certificate of completion that you can uh, show off to your LinkedIn connections or put on your website or something. Just, uh, I think it's really nice. 
Okay, and as my fourth and final section of this presentation, I'd like to talk about what I guess I would consider Ames's big ticket event, which is uh, the AI and Healthcare Symposium. So this is for sure the biggest Ames event of the year. Um, it uh, draws in uh, many, I think many more people uh, from many more fields than, than I guess our, our more general events. So this is a one to two day conference that includes uh, speaker series, booth fair, networking opportunities, and swag, of course. Um, this is open to everyone, so you don't have to be a U of A student or, you know, an undergrad or anything like that. And because of our generous sponsors, it is also completely free um, and will continue to be. So 2020, this was hosted Thursday, March 12th. I know some people have uh, told me that this was the last event that they remember attending before everything got locked down. I think this was Thursday and then Friday morning at like 1 a.m. all the U Alberta students got an email saying, okay, uh, don't come to school. And then of course, here we are now a year and a half later. Um, but even still, this was uh, a great success. We had over hundred attendees, 10 speakers, 10 sponsors and 15 booths. You can see our, our booth lineup here, some in-person pictures, which is very interesting and uh, our itinerary. Again, all of this is available on our website, which will be available in a moment. And then of course the show must go on. So 2021, we planned an entirely virtual symposium. We broke it into two days where day one was the community building side of things where we had uh, our booth there and various networking opportunities. And then day two, we really just focused on our speaker series. So this uh, garnered 158 attendees. These are people who actually like, logged in and, and watched some of the talks. And the real difference here is that we had attendees from nine different countries at this event. And so it was uh, a great honor being a university level student group uh, and having people from all over the world come to your event. Um, you know, we received emails from people. Uh, There's even one person that emailed asking for a certificate of attendance because he wanted to use it in like a, a job interview scenario. Um, so we also tried to make it feel as normal as possible. So um, all of the pre-registration people got a little uh, swag package in the mail. Um, that was a great idea from uh, one of my fellow execs. I don't know if any other student group has, has done something like that, at least at the U of A during the pandemic. Um, so yeah, here's a, our first page Zoom tile screenshot here. Um, this is a screen grab from uh, Dr. Osmar Zayan's talk where he talked about uh, diabetic retinopathy grading. Um, overall, we're uh, very happy with how this uh, event went. Okay, and now I'm very nearly at the end, I'm going to talk about where we want to take all of this as a as a group. So first of all, we want to expand to more Canadian institutions. We have heard that there's interest from uh, AI and medicine aligned student groups that are interested in rebranding uh, and becoming a part of the Ames family. Um, we want to continue to improve our AI and medicine curriculum, and we are going to push uh, that uh, it or something like it or parts of it be adopted in the medical student curriculum at different universities. We also got uh, interest uh, for Ames chapters beginning in uh, the, uh, the USA, the UK and Italy. So that would make it four countries with Ames groups and that's the underway right now. Uh, once that goes through, we would also like to elect uh, an international executive committee um, and really that group would be overseeing uh, AIMS events at an international level such that uh, everybody at every uh, AIMS chapter would at least be kept in the loop about what everybody else is doing. I'm sure that after things go back to in person, there will still be a decent number of events online. So hopefully that'll be a great way of kind of being part of a really amazing international group. Um, and to bring it kind of all back, uh, we want to continue to improve our local events um, and help to uh, basically foster new connections, um, create a space where people can learn and meet new people uh, and, and share ideas and really just try to serve our local community. Okay, before I end, 
Uh, I want to say thank you to Amy, Alberta Innovates, and the University of Alberta Precision Health Research Area. These three organizations have tirelessly supported AIMS basically from the very, very beginning. And so we definitely would not have been able to do everything that we did um, without the support of these uh, big three here. And uh, here is my calling card if you would like to stay in touch. Uh, so here's my email, my LinkedIn, and my Twitter. There's where you can find me. And then I think Zvon has put in the chat uh, this link tree. So if you have any uh, questions about AIMS um, or you know, you're know you not sure how to uh, get in contact, the link tree will have links to basically everywhere that we have a presence. Um, all right. And that is it for me. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we can open it up to some questions if anybody has them, but I'm happy to ask, uh, be the first one to ask. So you, you mentioned, Sarah, um, that there are uh, different chapters uh, of AIMS. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, where the AIMS chapters reside? Sure. So um, off the top of my head, we have uh, Dalhousie, University of Toronto, University of Victoria, and the University of British Columbia. Um, I know that we've uh, received interest beyond that, but we haven't uh, have, have it anything concrete yet. Um, so that, uh, that is something that if you want to know what happens, you have to stay up to date with us. Excellent. And we have a, a question from Diana. Feel free to feel free to ask. Hello, um, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm really impressed with the work that you guys are doing. And I know that organizing conferences are a lot of work. So uh, hats off to you on that, especially two years in a row. Um, I was interested in, uh, do you have information from the doctor's side, like exist um, people in the profession today? Like what is it that we building AI should keep in mind so that it meets their needs or they're comfortable with it or um, anything along that line. So, like what pieces would be helpful for them? Right, um, so of course, I think the very easiest way to start that is always keep the doctors in the loop. I think that sometimes AI is a little bit of a closed club and a lot of uh, researchers are very focused on publishing and maybe not so much making their tool immediately uh, usable and applicable to uh, the medical field. Um, I'll, I'll take a page out of my supervisor, uh, Dr. Greiner's book. Uh, he always asks why, like if I'm going to create a tool that uses AI for medicine, why do I want to create it? You know, you shouldn't be creating a tool just because it's like applying something new to, to a different uh, area and you know you're not really sure like it could work but you're not sure about the benefits um, I think just really uh, sitting down and thinking like how can this tool be translated into actual outcomes uh, in the clinic additionally uh, interpretability and explainability is really really important and so keeping that in mind uh, that will help uh, the adoption process I think go a little bit smoother because you're always going to run into the well. How does it work? How do we know it's correct? You know that kind of question. So, okay. And is your organization AI persons in medicine or medicine people with an interest in AI? I wasn't quite clear on that. Um, well, as as per right now, we're trying to make it a space for everybody at kind of every education level and every experience level in either of those fields. So we, we have people attending events that have worked on medical AI research for years, and we have people who uh, their education has nothing to do with medicine or AI. So really, we try to keep our events uh, teaching concepts that are understandable by uh, people of many different backgrounds. Um, so I guess... Uh, because of the curriculum, I would say that right now we think the, the highest importance should be placed on educating medical students about AI. Um, but that's not to say there aren't events that we're putting on that would be, um, I guess, useful for people from a more technical background and interesting for people from a more technical background. Okay. I mean, partly because I'm just interested in what medical students are interested about AI. Like, what would they like it to be able to do for them? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. 
Yeah, and we also have uh, Shane, uh, who has uh, also chimed into the chat to say the goal is to bring uh, both of these groups together to uh, communicate with each other. And and uh, and that's uh, both the goal and the challenge, I think. Yep, 100%. Um, and so, Sarah, uh, you mentioned uh, the symposium that happens recently. Um, or rather, I guess, on, a, on, on an annual basis now, but are there any other aims related activities that people can chime into either uh, this summer or, or later this year? Yeah, so we begin our official, uh, I guess, um, planned series of events starting in September because that's when the school year starts. Um, but yeah, we, we will still probably be sending out the occasional newsletter um, so people can stay up to date with how the project is going. And additionally, I think there was a company that reached out to us that wanted us to host a Q&A for them uh, to our community. So that is something that could be coming up. We just have to finalize uh, when that is going to happen. Um, so yeah, definitely we, we, we're planning events now. We're, we're trying to plan for every scenario and every combination of in-person and not in-person and everything. So things are still a little bit uh, distant at that point. So I can't promise any particular events coming up, but I think they'll all be great. Wonderful. Any more questions for Sarah? Last chance. Now, Sarah, I know you have uh, somewhere to be at 6 p.m., so I don't know if we'll get a chance to say goodbye to you at the end of this presentation, but please give a warm round of applause for Sarah. Um, what a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And, and uh, we will, uh, you know, feel free to go whenever you need to go. So, um, but we really appreciate your time this evening. Of course, thank you. Uh, and so uh, at the halfway point of this meetup, we usually like to open up the floor to the audience. Uh, so this is a chance for anyone and everyone to uh, share something new with what's happening. Uh, so this is either uh, a company. If you're a company that you're hiring, this is a good time to advertise that. If you're looking for work, if you're looking for mentorship, if you're working on a new AI related project that you would like people to tune into and share your GitHub link, then please do, this is the good time to do it. So if anybody has anything that they would like to share with the community, please do so now. I have no news on my end. This is perhaps a, a very rare time where, that I don't have anything to plug uh, during the meetup. Hey guys, uh, this is Frank Chang. Uh, I'm new to this group. I'm just sort of lurking right now. Hold on, I'm trying to look for my video <laughs> button here and uh, get my camera uh, turned on. Awesome, welcome, Frank. Hi, how's it going? So uh, I'm uh, actually with Flying Fish. We are a venture capital firm out in Seattle. Uh, and uh, we specifically look for uh, early stage AI and machine learning companies. Uh, so really my purpose is to learn more about Amy and just kind of get familiar with what everyone's doing. Um, like I said, just sort of lurking right now. Uh, but always looking for sort of uh, great startup ideas, specifically in AI and ML. So feel free to reach out if uh, you have any good deal flow. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, Frank, I'll also uh, share with you a link to uh, one of the, there's a Slack group here in Edmonton. Uh, so it's uh, the Edmonton startup group. Um, lots of uh, folks in there working on ML projects as well. So I'm happy to uh, share with you that link cool. uh, so you can connect with the group there. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, anybody else would like to share something before we move on? Okay, happy to move right along. Varun, are you with us? Uh, we are, uh, uh, we can move right along to the second presentation from Varun. Uh, Varun just recently uh, also finished an internship here at Amy, um, but he will be presenting his uh, a precursor to uh, his ma master's thesis. So uh, please welcome to the stage, Varun. Hi, I guess um, just share my screen. Um, yep, yeah, all good. Yeah, looking good, Varun. Hi, uh, hi everyone. So my name is Varun Ranganathan. Thanks, Juan, for giving me the stage. Um, I'm a master's student at the University of Alberta, and my supervisor is Denison Barbosa. Uh, I'm looking to complete my thesis in the coming month. And uh, yeah, this is my presentation on a new algorithm that I developed called Hoplop. It's a multi-hop link prediction algorithm over knowledge graphs. So I just like to give 
some time for the audience to answer this question. So this is a question from Jeopardy. And uh, yeah, I'll just give around 10 seconds for peop uh, people to come up with the correct entity for the uh, phrase one of these. So the uh, question is, even a broken one of these on your wall is right twice a day. Um, so yeah, I'll just give 10 seconds for people to share, shout out what one of these is. And you have to answer in a form of a question as per Jeopardy rules. Sure. Yeah. We have Andy Wong. What is a clock? Lots of people agree. Yep, my name and I agree with that. <laughs> that is the right answer. So even a broken clock is right twice a day. And that's exactly the same answer Watson gave during the episode. Uh, Jeopardy episode. And now I'll just move on to the last question Watson had to answer, which was the final Jeopardy question. And this was around for, for the topic of 19th century novels. So I'll give another 10 seconds to the audience. Uh, the question is William Wilkinson's An Account of the Principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia inspired this author's most famous novel. So I'll give around 10 seconds uh, to predict who this author is. Um, so I, I realize this is a slightly harder one. So let's 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 now be an AI system and see how we can answer this question. Uh, so first first question is what do we know? And we know that William Wilkinson is an entity, and he wrote this book, uh, an account of prin principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia. And this I put it in dashed lines because it's a it's an implicit uh, wrote relation because the question just says. William Wilkinson's. So yeah, he wrote this book. And uh, this book inspired some other thing. Uh, we don't know what that thing is. And that, that could be another book or another person, a video, who knows. Uh, but yeah, this book inspired this thing. And this uh, this thing now is, is a famous, is the most famous novel of some author. So now we know that the final goal is that we need to get an author. And uh, this author's most famous novel was inspired by this book written by this guy. And another constraint that we need to know is that this person the, we want to find at the end is a 19th century novel, uh, is novelist. So this is our reasoning scene. So we move from William Wilkinson. So they wrote, he wrote this book, which inspired these set of objects. And one of these or multiple of these objects uh, is the most famous novel of some uh, author. And this could also lead to multiple authors. And now, uh, this is a constraint matching that the author has to be a 19th century novelist. And therefore you get the answer who is Bram Stoker, which is the right answer. And uh, Watson went on to win a million bucks. So behind the scenes now, Watson is using 4 TB of data. And uh, in, this includes large scale knowledge graphs like WordNet, Yago, and TBpedia. Now what knowledge graphs did was it enabled Watson to identify relationship between entities. So WordNet, for example, is one of the knowledge graphs used and it has information about words and how one word relates to all other words in the English language. Uh, DBpedia and Yago contain facts about the world. Now without knowledge graphs, Watson would have to learn everything from what is English to how English is structured, how language goes through to everything about the world. Okay, now that Watson knows English, it needs to read the whole web and study everything that's happened in throughout it history, at least what's on the internet. Uh, but with KGs now, uh, Watson had the potential to represent all in data or all languages in one interpretable or explainable framework. Because an, a, a KG is explainable by default because every uh, all the, the graph is labeled and can be understood by human. Let's take a more exa practical example of where we're using AI and how knowledge graphs are used. So, hey, Google is uh, usually a queue that we use. My Google is just on. Yeah, so you, you can ask Google saying, uh, play Apollo by, by Hardwell on Spotify. And what Google needs to know is what are all these things I'm talking about? What is playing? What is Apollo? What is Hardwell and what is Spotify? So, so what Google Assistant really needs to know is that Spotify is an app. Uh, Spotify is installed on this device uh, and Spotify can play. 
Um, so why does Spotify, why does Google need to know that Spotify is an app? So let's say I say, say that command out and then Google might just be like, okay, what is Spotify? And give you a Wikipedia page of Spotify, which is going to be quite useless. Um, now coming to Spotify, for Spotify side, what does Spotify need to know? It needs to know that Apollo is a song. Hardwell is an artist and Apollo is a song by Hardwell. So wh why, why do we need to do this fact checking? It's to handle errors. So what if there was no song Apollo by Hardwell? Um, instead of playing some spurious thing, Spotify could ask me, well, there is no song like this. Do you want me to play something similar? And this is what we, I believe will lead to software 2.0 where you know, we use AI to drive decisions in software. We see that KGs are crucial, uh, are a crucial knowledge source for uh, tasks such as question answering, automated decision making, search. It has been used in search forever. Uh, for example, if you type uh, about a person on Google, on, on Google search, you'll get an info box. And that is directly, the information on the info box is directly from the Google knowledge graph. So this knowledge graph contains the entity that's the person you're searching for and all the properties of them, like the date, uh, where they're working, who their spouse is, et cetera. And recently, even knowledge graphs have been uh, seen to help explain explainable AI. Uh, but the problem is that all these tasks require knowledge graphs to be accurate and complete because they're the you know, base of knowledge that the machine learning model uses. Um, and achieving this goal for a general purpose task is very difficult. So which begs the question, why can't we create KGs manually? Like why can't we continue doing so? Uh, for a specific task, this is okay. Uh, for example, uh, WordNet is a very specific data set. It, it contains um, expert annotations of 150K words and phrases over the English language. Uh, but yeah, it, this, this data set took 27 years of effort. Uh, so we can see that manual methods don't really scale to world level. Uh, data. So can we automate KG construction? Yes, of course, computers, right? Um, but current state of the art um, information extraction tools don't really understand the nuances of uh, natural language. Even language models that are actually trained to recognize patterns in language fail to understand natural the nuances in our natural language. So let's go back to this example. Uh, for all the NLP enthusiasts there, uh, you can recognize that you can change replace one of these with mask and you can feed it into BERT. So, and BERT is a language model that, well, models language. Um, so let's ask BERT the same question. So let's say even a broken mask on your wall is right twice a day. So the task for BERT is to predict what mask is. So it's in the place for one of these. And we go right in and put that sentence, the word into BERT and uh, BERT predicts window and clock is at the fifth position with a probability of 3.3, which is quite low. Uh, what's happening here is that BERT does not really understand that broken implies stop. It's, it's implicit that you know broken here is, means that the clock is stopped. So now let's go ahead and change broken to stop because we, we are a really good reasoning tool ourselves. So we, once we change broken to stop, we see that you know, BERT's able to predict that, yeah, you mean clock now. And yeah, that's the right answer for the, the question there. So we can see that most of these tasks require some sort of reasoning, and that's going to be the theme of my presentation. So I'm going to be exploring the space of automated reasoning tools over large knowledge graphs. So the goal is that given a set of facts are about the world that we represent as a knowledge graph, can we derive new facts that fill in gaps in, of knowledge? So this problem is called the knowledge-based computation problem, and it stems from the uh, the fact here. So a fact is represented by a tree tuple where the first position represents the source entity or the query entity. The second position represents the relation and the third position represents the target entity or the predicate. Uh, so the question, like I said, what we do is we go on Google and search for a person we want to. And what we're basically saying is, give me all the information about this entity. And therefore we uh, want to find all the relations uh, it is connected to and all the entities it's also connected to. And that's the base of knowledge-based completion. And now a question arises like, why should we be, be interested in this? Um, so KBC gives us a framework for us to understand, you know, automated reasoning tools. And more important, more recently, it's also helps us in understanding XAI tools. And 
KBC allows us to complete knowledge trust itself, which is a really useful data structure or a source of knowledge. And this, therefore, if we complete knowledge trust, we also support downstream tasks like question answering, search, and recommendation systems. So how has K KPC been tackled before? So there are two approaches here. One is using expert rules. Uh, and one primary approach that we'll be going over is using machine learning. So using expert rules, I'll just explain about WordNet, which is created by manually, manually created. So for the, the relations in the WordNet uh, are actually derived based on rules that have been defined by experts. So this is a, a screenshot from Wikipedia of all some of the rules that WordNet uses to uh, derive new facts about different words in the non in English, different words and phrases in English. Now we'll tackle, uh, we'll look at how KBC is tackled with machine learning. And uh, for this, I'll uh, explain two sub parts of this. So there's going to be knowledge graph embeddings, where it's a graph embedding techniques, the graph embedding techniques and multi-hop approaches, which learns to traverse the graph to find uh, find evidence that this path represents some sort of relation. So I'll just uh, play this small video. Um, this is not a screenshot from me, but uh, this video explains transit really well, which is uh, the base uh, knowledge graph embedding that we're using. Uh, so we can see from this video that uh, all these dots are people. Uh, the triangle represents teams. Triangles here represent teams. Uh, the diamond represents age. And uh, there's square somewhere here, uh, all scattered around. So that represents positions in a football team. And now uh, these are these vectors and uh, points in space have been randomly uh, initialized. So during the training process, what Transy does is to try to find a, a representation for each entity and relation in the graph. So how it does this is that it's it's able to uh, Cut cluster all the points that represent person and all the points that represent uh, ages, all the points that represent uh, forwards I and mean, positions, and all the points that represent uh, teams. So the 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 idea behind this kind of embedding is that if I want to find the age of Lionel Messi, so what I do is I start at Lionel Messi, represented by some point, and I add a vector to that point. Uh, which is given by is age of. So is age of is another vector in the same space. And now once I add this, I, I translate from the spot from Lionel Messi to another spot given by is age. And now what I do when I come close to here, I find the closest entity to the uh, to this point here, and that's going to be Lionel Messi's age. Uh, similarly, if I want to know uh, what position Lionel Messi plays for. So I start at Messi, I add has position vector, and I reach the forward position. Now, similarly, if I want to find out which team uh, Lil Messi plays for, I start from Messi again, plus is member of, and uh, that gives me team Argentina. Each of these uh, vectors are called translation vectors. Um, uh, the other approaches are known as multi-hop approaches. And these approaches are being, these approaches have been used for, uh, to predict links on all sorts of graphs, not just knowledge graphs, but social graph, network graphs, and uh, very recently the shopping graph. Um, so let's just look at a very simple page rank algorithm that we apply on a general graph. And I'll explain how you can, it's the same principle to apply it on knowledge graphs. So let's take this graph we have here and uh, this uh, this graph is uh, uh, there's a trans uh, transition probability matrix A, and uh, which gives you the probability of uh, moving from one entity to another entity. So if I say if a probability for moving from one to two is going to be two point five. So from this is the from and this is two. So if I want to move from the first node to the second node, the probability is 2.5. Whereas if I move from first node to the third node, the probability is 0.75. Now this is the transition matrix for this uh, graph and V represents the position we want to start from. This We're trying to do a path uh, traversal here. And uh, we want to start from V and take steps forward in the graph. So to do that, we just multiply A into V and you normalize the vector you get in the end. So at the end of the first hop, I mean, yeah, the first hop, uh, if starting from two, uh, see the, the weight for one and so the, the, the information from two flows from one and three. 
uh, and 0 0.707 at root to one and 0 0.707 root to three. Uh, similar, you do the step similarly for, you, you take this as the new vector to start from, multiply it by the uh, transition probability and you normalize these scores again. For the second step, you get this and you do the same thing for the third step, you get this. So what I want to point out here is that at five for, for the uh, node five, we get the probability of zero point, not probability, like a score of 0 0.789. And this is, uh, you can see that this node is connected, uh, has two inward and two outward connections. And most importantly, it has a loop here. Uh, so the problem with this is that it, the weight moves from four all the way back to five and then goes to four again and back to five. So there's spuriously adding more weightage to uh, the node five. Uh, why this affects knowledge graphs is uh, because in the knowledge graph scenario, uh, you, especially the Wikidata scenario, you have around 4.8 million edges to United States, uh, but for the 10th highest country, uh, yeah, you have, it's the Netherlands, and you, had a, you have a, only around 160k links to it. Uh, this kind of shows the skew node degree um, that it's, it's a very similar concept like in your data set, you have one, examples for one class more than the other class. So it's similarly in the knowledge graph, you have examples for United States more than the Netherlands. And the ratio of the examples is from 4.8 million to 160K. So this range affects it a lot. Um, so yeah, now I'm gonna go over Hoplop, uh, which is the algorithm I created during my masters. Uh, so before that, we just get into insights that we you know, bring out from previous approaches. So knowledge graph embeddings, uh, embedding methods, like they represent entities, discrete entities as continuous points in space. So now if I were just, if I were, if I were to just uniformly weigh all the points in space, I should uh, be able to mitigate the skewed node degree issue. Uh, basically any, any point in space will not, uh, US will be just represented by some point in space and Netherlands will be represented by another point in space and it won't, they, they won't be, there is no links to it as such, or there's, yeah, there's no links to it. And there is, there's no way that uh, US has more preference over Netherlands in this space. Um, another insight we get is that in the space, uh, any entity, you from one entity, you can reach any other entity. So let's say you have two entities, A and B, and uh, you want to traverse the continuous space such that you you move from A and you reach B at the end of the traversal. Uh, but if you look at this, it's in the continuous space, right? And there is definitely one link, at least one link between A and B. That's And that link is B minus A because they're all points in space. So therefore you can look at this entity embedding space as something that's more complete and, and it's unconstrained by the links. So this allows the path traverser of Hoplop to traverse anywhere in the graph without any question without any constraints. And that's our hypothesis. So the performance of a link, uh, a multi-hop link prediction algorithm can be improved, improved if uh, it is allowed to leverage graph traversals that are not constrained by the links. So therefore it's traversing over an embedding space, a continuous space, and there are no links exactly in the space. Uh, so for to this end, we introduce Hoplop, it's a new algorithm and it's end-to-end -end differentiable. Uh, so it uses uh, gradient descent to optimize. And in this frame, uh, this framework, uh, there are two things that's happening. One is uh, the, the model learns how to traverse the embedding space. And while it's learning to traverse, it's also learning to predict whether the links exist in the graph or not. I'll just explain Hoplop uh, in terms of this uh, animation. And uh, this is, uh, for a completely trained hoplop model. So the goal now is to answer the question, what type of movies does uh, K James Cameron uh, uh, direct? Um, now you can see that James Cameron's here and all the movies are clustered here. I mean, sorry, all the genres of movies are clustered here. Um, so how would we go about this? So there's two things as I said, there's a path uh, finder and the path reasoner. So let, I'll be talking about the path uh, reasoner, uh, path finder first. Uh, let's consider a, a positive pair of entities. That's James Cameron does direct uh, science fiction movies. So there's a Pathfinder, which is a simple artificial neural network. Um, I, it's not even a deep learning network because there's only one hidden layer. 
uh, which is ReLU activated. So what happens is that uh, we give James Cameron and the uh, final destination science fiction to the ANN and we produce and the ANN produces a vector V1. And now we take that vector from and we move traverse from James Cameron plus V1. We get to this point. It, it doesn't really matter what the point is, but we get to that point. Uh, now we want to go further towards you know, science fiction. So we take another step. Now take the, the ANN, the Pathfinder takes the current position in space and then the final destination that's science fiction again. And it produces a vector V2. Uh, now you traverse from this, the news position to another position that's much closer to science fiction. So the final destination is now James Cameron plus V1 plus V2. Now let's take a, let's look at pathfinding for a negative example. That's James Cameron and our romantic moves. So we have another, we have the same pathfinder with the same weights. Uh, you again, give it uh, the current position that's James Cameron and the final destination that's romantic. You send it to the ANN and it gives you a V1 vector. So, and V1 is that, and it moves towards Canada. Now you want to go closer towards romantic. So uh, you do the same step again. You take uh, the current position uh, of the model and again, the final destination, you pass it through the ANN and it gives you a vector V2, which you use to traverse the space. Now for the next step, uh, you again take the position you're at and the final position you want to go towards and you generate a vector V3. And now it moves towards romantic. Now, uh, just uh, for an information, so uh, the Pathfinder does not take any signal that this is a positive or this is a negative uh, entity, uh, negative pair of entity. It just tries to find some path from one entity to another entity. The, now the link prediction is done by uh, a path reasoner. And what this path reasoner is, it's an RNN. Uh, an LSTM is a more complicated form of RNN. But basically what it does is it, uh, takes in uh, the vectors that are being outputted by the ANN and it generates a representation for this path. So what the LSTM network does is uh, it uh, sequentially identifies patterns within the data and uh, it takes up V1, generates another hidden state embedding. And now it takes up again V2 and generates another hidden state embedding. And now this hidden state embedding at the end of the traversal uh, is sent to logistic regression. Uh, which is uh, basically trained to say whether this link exists or not. Uh, similarly, in for a negative example, uh, you you send V1 to the LSTM, uh, which generates some hidden representation, stated representation. Uh, you send V2 again, which generates another representation. You send V3 and it generates another representation. And now you send that final representation to a logistic regression model, which then predicts this link does not exist. Now more on, uh, more, moreover, so now if you're traversing over a transient embedding space, uh, since all the entities and relations are, are present in that space, it, you can make this method interpretable, if not explainable. Um, so for example, James can, a V1 positive is a very close to director of, and a V2 positive is very close to uh, genre. So we can say that the uh, rule that Hoplop took to uh, determine that James Cameron predicts science fiction is uh, that you know James Cameron is director of all these uh, movies, and uh, from there, he, and then the genre of these movies are science fiction. So therefore, James Cameron produces uh, direct science fiction movies. Uh, now let's take the path from James Cameron to uh, romantic. So we say that the path says that. James Cameron, a citizen of Canada, and uh, Titanic was shot in Canada, and the movie, uh, the genre of Titanic is romantic. Now, that's there is a path between James Cameron and romantic, but that's not the right explanation to. That's not the right explanation for why James Cameron directs uh, romantic movies. And uh, this way, Hoplop uh, is trained to uh, traverse the graph while distinguishing whether a path exists or not, and the link exists or not. So a little bit of math here. Uh, so the task basically here is to figure out whether the, this 
particular relation exists between any two uh, any two entities. Q represents all the query entities and T represents all the target entities. Now, what we want to do is we want to traverse the graph and we introduce this path uh, variable here. And now we, uh, we have to multiply it, multiply it by the probability that the path exists. But since we are going to you know, traverse this continuous space, the path definitely exists. And therefore you move, put this probability to one and you, you, you're remaining with this term. And now, since the path is also influenced by your you know, source and target uh, variables, you can just eliminate them from the uh, modeling process. Uh, it's the helpers law, and uh, yeah, the 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 overall task simplifies that. Given this relation, uh, no, given this path, does this relation exist or not? And this is the main task you want to solve. So the modeling stage is that uh, we need to be, we need to have a path first, which is given by the vector v1 all the way to vector vh. H is the number of hops, which is a hyperparameter we tune from 1, 3, 5, 10, 15, and 20. Now these vectors are actually uh, generated by the ANN, uh, by the ANN and the parameters of the ANN, uh, which takes up the current position that's given by this. So uh, yeah, current position given by this and the destination, that's the final position that the path finally needs to go towards. Uh, now, once this path is generated, uh, you can, this path is sent to an LSTM model, which uh, later is, which later generates a representation for the path, which is then uh, sent to a logistic regression with, and the sigma, sig, sig, sigma sign here means sigmoid. So in the end, you're going to be predicting a probability between zero and one, uh, whether the relation exists or not. So the two objectives that we, of that we're trying to solve here uh, during the training phase is that we want the pathfinder to traverse from the query entity to target entity, regardless of whether it, uh, it is a positive pair or a negative pair of entities. Uh, so here the loss is very simple. It's a, it's a simple uh, Euclidean square, mean squared loss or sum of squared losses. Uh, basically here, this is the target destination position. And this is the position where the pathfinder reaches after the traversal process. So all we want to do is to uh, minimize the distance uh, the, of the end position and the target position. Now, the second and the main goal is that we want to find uh, predict whether the relation exists between that query entry and target entity. And to do this, we use a simple uh, binary cost entropy loss. And uh, to train the network, we uh, train all these models together. We uh, use uh, simple gradient descent. Uh, specifically, we use the atom optimizer. So we can see that in this uh, equation that um, the grade, the error from the logistic regression is uh, is propagated, back propagated to the LSTM. And the LSTM, the job of the LSTM is just to predict whether the relation exists or not. But by doing so, it's able to even send the gradients through the path. And that way, once it goes through the path, it also affects the, the, gra the gradients also affect the uh, pathfinder. So basically the LSTM controls how the pathfinder moves for a particular uh, positive pair of entries and a particular negative pair of entries. So I'm um, to my the final section, that's the results and experiments. So we want to do some extensive uh, testing on this model and we tested it on two flavors of link prediction. So the relation prediction task is an intrinsic task. So why is it intrinsic? It's because this is the task Hoplop was uh, develop for to predict the relation between two entities. So the task goes like this, given a query entity and a set of positive and target negative uh, exam, uh, target entries, predict whether relation of interest exists between the query entry and all these set of target entries. Uh, the metric now we, the, we use is the mean uh, average precision metric. And uh, an intuition of this metric is that if you want to produce a perfect score of uh, one, uh, perfect map score of one, uh, your model would have to uh, provide a higher score for the positive entities, uh, for all positive entities compared to all negative entities. So they, it must be able to dif differentiate perfectly between all the positive target entities and negative target entities. Uh, for the entity prediction task, it's an entrance action task. So Hoplop is not de de defined or developed for this task, but we can, we can still use it to do this task. And uh, this task is, 
from the literature of knowledge graph embeddings, uh, whereas relation prediction is uh, from the literature of multi op reasoning. So entity prediction goes like this: given the query entity and the relation, find all the entities that uh, find all the target entities that are linked to this query entity through via this relation. And the metrics that we use for this is uh, the mean reciprocal rank uh, hits at one, three, and ten. The hits at k metric is uh, is like top at k metric. So hits at one gives the model one time to predict the correct entity. Um, it's at three gives the model three and it's at 10 gives it 10 attempts to predict the right answer. Uh, so we use we uh, use four data sets to try a test out our approach. Uh, from the relation prediction literature, we take out uh, the NEL uh, data set and the fee based data sets. Uh, and we introduce two more data sets, uh, WordNet and uh, WordNet, the WordNet RR data set, WN18RR, and the Yago data set. So these two data sets have been introduced in the entity prediction sense, but they have not been introduced for relation prediction. So we do we modify them a little bit to uh, use them in our framework. So these are some of the results uh, on the uh, NEL task. So uh, by the way, mOplop is a very small extension of hoplop where instead of modeling just for one relation in knowledge graph, uh, we're able to model for all relations in knowledge graph. Um, we, and we can do this simply because of gradient descent. Uh, the last logistic regression layer is changed to a multiple logistic regression layer. So anyways, uh, we can see that a hoplop and mloplop uh, that have been trained over the transi embedding space perform better than all our baselines. Uh, our baselines include transi, which is the, the space it traverses over. Uh, PRA is the path ranking algorithm, which is based off page rank. Uh, deep path is another path traversal algorithm that uh, uses RL to train the model. Uh, Minerva also uses RL, but an LSTM uh, network. And MWalk is a uh, general graph walking algorithm that, have been, that has been applied to knowledge graphs. So we can see that uh, over on overall, we can see that uh, NEL uh, hoplop performs better than the baselines on NERF. So on the free-based uh, data set, which is uh, considered harder, uh, we can see that hoplop over transi, complex, and tucker, which are three different embeddings, different, and they differ, they widely differ. Uh, so even though hoplop traverses over widely different uh, embeddings, it's able to still perform the same at the end. And we can see the same thing with hemoplop, and uh, we can see that both mOplop and hoplop that traverses over these embedding spaces perform better than the previous multi-op algorithms and the baseline uh, KG embedding algorithms. On the WordNet data set, we, we see similar results again. Uh, the scores are the map scores presented here. And uh, again, we see that hoplop performs much better than the baseline embeddings, uh, except for mHoplop Tucker. Um, the reason why we believe it doesn't work very well for Tucker is um, because of the space. The entity embedding space in Tucker is very complex, and this might inhibit LSTM, the LSTM model to search for correct paths or the ANN model to search for uh, good paths. Uh, for a, uh, the transi model, because it's very simple, the LSTM is able to understand its global structure and can account for errors in it very easily. And therefore, that, that's exactly what we can see uh, happen. So, Hoplop perform with transi performs much better than hoplop and tucker, uh, complex and tucker. This has been seen in the previous experiments as well. And it the performance also deteriorates uh, a lot from in the hemoplop setting. And we believe this is because we are trying to model so many functions, uh, so many relations at once. And if, because the space gets more and more complex, the model is not able to you know, keep up. Uh, this is a result from the Yago dataset. Uh, I had uh, starred has gender uh, because of this, um, because of the biasness of the this relation in the dataset. So if I had a baseline that just predicted male all the time, uh, I would get a map score of 0 0.63, which is higher than the map scores of the baseline, uh, which tells that maybe it's making some mistakes predicting male and female. Uh, but hoplop 
and hemoplop is able to uh, do slightly better than just predict male. So probably it's predicting uh, males correctly, and it's also able to identify a few females. So it's able to mitigate that biasness in data. Uh, similarly, these these are the relations that we have tested it on, and we again see similar performance that uh, hoplop we boost the performance of link prediction over these knowledge graph embedding models. So in the context of entity prediction, uh, we test against four different metrics and the two data sets we introduce. So MWOC, Minerva, and reward shaping is uh, our three multi-hop models, uh, complex, transient, are our KT embedding models, and complex, complex entry is, is a hybrid model that, that combines complex and a set of a uh, few rules in knowledge graphs. And we compare all these models to Hoplop, which is, which is operated over, which is operating over Transi. And uh, we see that uh, uh, Hoplop is significantly better than the previous uh, baselines. And uh, for the Yago data set, we get similar results. Uh, Yago has been only uh, operated by knowledge graph embedding. So these are all the state of the art embeddings that we get from uh, papers with code. And we can again see that Hoplop Transi performs much better than the previous models. Uh, and I also wanted to compare our uh, training and testing times uh, to show that you know, Hoplop is faster as well, not just efficient, but faster. So we, uh, we compare against Minerva and MBOC. Uh, these are two multi-hop models. And for the first one, uh, that's the just one hop, Hoplop. Uh, it's the fastest in the sense of testing that it takes only 3.6 3.6 milliseconds to uh, test one sample, uh, or yeah, the app is one sample. Uh, you can uh, see that the training time takes 3.7 hours. So this is because of high patients. I had a patient of 100 and 100 epochs, and this did not allow me to terminate very quickly. But if I look at the uh, hop hoplop trans e h equals five, that's five hop hoplop out five steps. Uh, it's it trains in 0 0.5 hours, that's how 30 minutes. And its testing speed is similar to M M work. Uh, so you can see that the testing speed is similar, but the trading is like 28x, uh, which is significant. It's half an hour to 14, uh, 14, half an hour to 14 hours of difference. And for the worst performing hoplop model, that's the one with 20, uh, 20 steps, it takes around 1.1 hours to train it. And it is it's slightly faster than the Minerva model for testing. And yeah, um, the conclusion is that Hoplop works. So yeah, I'm getting my masters hopefully. Um, and the, the basic goal is that is if the tra trust traversal process is uh, unconstrained, uh, the model learns to create a traversal function from the data itself. And I think uh, that's, uh, the general rule of thumb in ML, like if you're if you're not constraining the model to do things, it learns something that is more flexible than what you think. Uh, so how do you apply Hoplop? So assuming that you're already using a KG embedding model, uh, to use Hoplop, you just need to train Hoplop to traverse over whatever KG embedding space you're already using. And you don't have to replace with any other model, like usually negative sampling need to be replaced, you don't have to do that. Or you don't need to find, you don't need to add extra models like pathfinding. Uh, many multi of models actually find all the paths and then uh, learn to rank them, which is exactly what path ranking algorithm does. And yeah, uh, these are my future research questions. Is that can we model, like can we learn knowledge from raw text? Can we learn uh, from, can we extract knowledge like in the form of facts? Uh, from raw text directly through this hopping method. Uh, and also, can we get a uniform representation for knowledge? Uh, why a uniform representation for knowledge? It can make uh, it can make embeddings robust. And because embeddings are used generally to do downstream tasks, we want those embeddings to be robust. And uh, yeah, if we can model something like a knowledge space, we can ensure that these embeddings can be more robust than what they are right now. Thank you. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Varun. Thanks for sharing all your hard work. Um, uh, we, we have a few questions already. So uh, uh, 
please, Mat Matisse, I, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, but please ask your question. No, no, you're pronouncing it right. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you for the talk. It was, it was quite an awesome talk. In, in fact, it was my introduction to knowledge graph based uh, theory. Uh, I've, I've looked at this from far away, but never uh, put my mind into this. And so thank you for the very good introduction, I guess. Mm -hmm. And not only introduction, but also advanced stuff. Um, you you quite, kind of already answered my question with your future of works because um, in my research, I'm trying to build uh, not a knowledge graph, but something similar to it. And so my question was, okay, now you are able to complete a knowledge graph that you already have, but what about while well, building it and in increasing uh, the size of the knowledge graph for use new data, for example, or some, something else like that. So you, you have already kind of answered it at the, at the end, but if you have more to give us, I would take it right, uh, greatly, yeah. Yeah, uh, so from my experience, I've seen that knowledge graphs contain two things. They have the knowledge graph populator that uh, goes over the web to scrape and get entities from the internet. And the knowledge base completion now tries to find relations between these entities and uh, one entity that you find newly and all, all the other entities. Um, yeah, the goal, right, currently, yeah, they don't work together. Like They're two separate systems. Yeah, the goal is that once you get into the embedding space, can we do everything together? Because you're already able to get into end systems that, you know, take some raw input of text and give you some kind of decision or give you sentiment of that uh, text, which is quite fascinating that able to, we're able to do it end to end. But the problem previously that exists that you can't reason over it end to end. You can't reason end to end. Uh, I hope that Hoplop, you know, gets us closer to reasoning end to end. And the same way you can probably you know, reason while populating. You can do knowledge-based con construction while completion while knowledge-based population. That'll be something interesting to see. Can't wait to see that. Uh, Varun, could you, um, could you show us a few examples of interpreted rules that Hoplop follows? Yeah. Uh, so, these are some of the rules that we uh, observed. Uh, so one of the rules that shows how athlete plays sports. So this is the relation that we want to find. And uh, now the goal is that can we find uh, paths that Hoplog takes that can you know support or refute this uh, this relation. So for example, if Hoplog takes a path like say athlete plays for team and then this team plays the sport, uh, therefore you know athlete plays the sport. It, uh, it gives the reasoner enough evidence to say, yeah, this, this link exists. That, so for example, if Messi plays for team Barcelona and Barca plays the sport football, so therefore Messi does play football. Uh, but a negative path uh, it goes like this. So let's say uh, some person has some, citizen, has some citizenship and in that country, there are fans of the sport. So if that is the best path between the two entities, uh, that does, that's not enough evidence for the reasoner to say, yeah, this person plays sport. For example, if I say Messi has citizenship of Spain and uh, he, he's an Argentinian player, but he has citizenship of Spain. And uh, now there are uh, football fans in Spain. So therefore, you know, Messi plays football. That's not the right reasoning, right? Um, that's exactly something that I'm trying to see. Negative examples. Can we refute facts faster than predict facts? Uh, another one from the freebase uh, data set is that uh, is to identify which location an event is happening in. Uh, let's say now there's the, uh, the NAC, NCAA basketball tournament uh, and there's a team that plays this tournament. And now that team is located in this location. Uh, therefore, uh, you can say that this tournament, NCAA basketball tournament, occurs in this location of the speed, uh, sports team. Now, similarly, a negative path would be something like this. So let's say this film occurs uh, in, a, in this film festival, which is an event, hosts this uh, film here. And now this film is one of the titles in a Netflix genre. And uh, Netflix genres uh, have locations as well. And now if that is in some, and that movie is in the Netflix genre of some location, that, that does not say that that 
the film festival happened in that location just that that movie was shot in that location and that's that's why the reasoner would say no this this fact does not exist uh graduated from is another uh task from the yago dataset so if a person has uh, an academic advisor who works at this university uh, there's a high chance that that person graduated from that university now let's say some person was born in uh, a location and now that university is also located in uh, the university that you have is also located in that uh, in that location now if this is the strongest path in the graph that's not enough evidence for the reasoner to say that that uh, link exists between the two entities uh, simply because many students graduate from universities that are far off from their workplace. Yeah, I think that answers my question. Thank you, Varun. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing. Any more questions for Varun this evening? All right, then. Then please uh, uh, join me in uh, giving Varun uh, a round of applause. Thanks so much for. Uh, taking time this evening to share uh, your expertise you. with us. And we wish you all the best uh, uh, with with your uh, uh, thesis. Uh, and uh, we look forward to hearing uh, to, to, to hearing how it goes. Uh, and so this uh, wraps up our uh, May AI meetup. Uh, this um, this event would not exist uh, without the support of, of you, our community. So uh, please connect with us. Uh, if you have any questions about the meetup, if you are interested in presenting at a future meetup, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and again, this, this meetup will be available uh, on our YouTube page. Uh, that's the Amy uh, Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute YouTube page. So uh, feel free to uh, revisit this uh, uh, meetup as well. But uh, not only that, do check out our YouTube page because we have a lot of uh, not only past meetups, but we also have a lot more technical talks presented at the AI seminars and at the Tea Time talks uh, that were hosted at the University of Alberta, uh, as well as other past lectures that we've hosted. So there's lots of content there to explore. We encourage you to uh, peruse at your leisure. But with that said, we do uh, hope to see you again uh, at, the, at next month's meetup, uh, which will be scheduled on June 17th. And uh, once again, thank you to our uh, presenters, uh, Sarah and Varun, for sharing their time and expertise with us this evening. And uh, uh, thank you, audience, for joining us today. So we wish you all the best in the coming month. And uh, cheers and have a good night. <laughs>